Good morning and a very warm welcome to this session of extended contact program being conducted through teleconferencing. In this session today, we will have a discussion on National Assessment and Accreditation Council, NAC. In the context of the changes impacting higher education, NAC is increasingly going to play a very important role. Established in 1994, it is addressing the quality issues in higher education in the context of the changes impacting higher education in India today. For this session today, we have Dr. Lata Pillai, Pro Vice Chancellor Indira Gandhi National Open University. Dr. Lata Pillai carries with her a very rich experience of having worked with two premium bodies in the country, that is University Grants Commission, UGC, and also NAC, which as you know is also a body of the UGC itself. So Dr. Lata Pillai, I invite you for this session. Uh, the structuring of this session is uh, as follow, and uh, if uh, it's okay with you, I think we can have a presentation for about uh, half an hour, 25 minutes to 30 minutes, and then we can open the session for discussion. For that discussion, we would like you to interact with us. Uh, please throw up uh, your questions, concerns, and issues, and I'm sure that Dr. Lata Pele will be very happy to address those issues. We want to make this session very interactive. So, Dr. Lata Pele, please. Thank you, Poonam, and welcome to all the viewers, students of the Postgraduate Diploma in Higher Education. Uh, what I'll try and do within the time given to me is make a brief presentation on the reasons for quality assurance, why it's gained importance in the recent past, what is it that NAC has been doing, what are the challenges that NAC faces, and generally a brief background of the issues which higher education is facing. Uh, it was Peter Drucker, one of the management gurus who spoke about uh, a decade ago when he made the statement that 30 years from now our educational institutions will be relics of the past. I am not sure if they will really become relics, but it's becoming increasingly certain that the nature of our higher education institutions is rapidly changing. The student clientele is becoming very diverse. Funding is becoming highly competitive. The profile of learners is changing. Delivery modes are undergoing drastic changes. With these competing demands on the higher education system, the principles of learning in the 21st century itself is changing. The first slide is a presentation on what are the principles of learning in the 21st century. Learning will become an essential part of everyday activity. We all talk of lifelong learning, so I will not go into the de details of these bullets, but just make this for your easy understanding. Learning technologies that we use will have to respond flexibility, uh, flexibly to learner needs and learning will increasingly becoming, become a collaborative enterprise. With this background, with, the, with this background of principles of learning in the 21st century, I'd I'd like, I would like to just take you into the National Assessment and Accreditation Council was established in the year 1994 as an outcome of the National Policy of Education and the Program of Action. One of the recommendations was that we need to have a body which will evaluate quality and suggest measures for the improvement of quality in higher education institutions. The NAC over the past decade or so has done the assessment and accreditation of more than 3,000 plus institutions, which is a very small number compared to the large number of institutions that we have. The philosophy with which NAC operates is that every institution should be self-regulating and accreditation itself is a voluntary process. If accreditation is voluntary, what are the motivating factors for institutions to undergo the accreditation process? And uh, I'd also like to tell you the brief changes that have taken place and the present procedure that the NAC adopts. 
For an institution to apply for accreditation, you first undergo an institution eligibility for quality assessment. It is called the IEQA. And once an institution clears the IEQA, you enter into the main stage of accreditation. Now, why undergo quality evaluation? Is it, is it possible for a third party to evaluate quality? These are questions which are constantly asked. How can, you, how can you evaluate quality? What is quality? Of course, the oldest definitions of quality was that quality is like beauty. You know it when you see it, but you can't define it. We've moved far from there. We now talk in terms of input, processes, output. We talk in terms of strategic planning. We talk in terms of having a value framework when assessing quality. And the philosophy of NAC itself is that the quality assessment is driven by uh, self-assessment of the institution. Now, what are the purposes of self-assessment? Self-assessment helps to identify the institution's strengths and weaknesses, a first step which is towards improvement. It's like saying a centipede was a happy creature till, no, till somebody asked it, which leg do you put forward first? So when you do a self-assessment process, when you undergo the self-study, as we call it, you are trying to identify your institution's strengths and weaknesses. Look at strengths and weaknesses before the issues and problems become critical or impossible to address. Another purpose of self-assessment is that human and other resources of the organization can be put to effective use so that management decision-making is evidence-based. An experience with the NACS assessment and accreditation process also tells us that preparation of the self-study report helps an institution to document its activities so that the desired outcome of the, of the organization's activities are known across the institution and it's not uh, spur of the moment decisions that are taken. It also helps in generating information which is useful in planning and decision making. With these brief purposes of the self-assessment process, an institution prepares a self-study report. Now what are the criteria on which a self-study report is prepared or the criteria based on which an institution is evaluated? The following are the seven criteria curricular aspects, teaching, learning and evaluation, research, consultancy and extension, infrastructure and learning resources, student support and progression, governance and leadership, innovative practices. Now these are the seven criteria that have been articulated which go into the functioning of an institution and under each of these criteria we have key aspects, we have benchmark statements and performance indicators to evaluate an institution. So basically it's a big man, it's a detailed manual which will ask you questions on a number of areas. Let me go into some of the key aspects of criterion one that is curricular aspects. You will have a large number of questions or pointers which look at how the curriculum is designed and developed in a particular college or a university, what are the mechanisms that you have, what is the academic flexibility that is available to learners when you design a curriculum, does the institution have any mechanism of collecting feedback, how often does a college or a university update its curriculum and of course last we have, uh, uh, shall I say, an open-ended question on what are the best practices in curricular aspects. This way we run through all the seven criteria that we have. The second criteria on teaching, learning and evaluation. Here we look into what are the admission processes of institutions, what is the kind of student profile that you have. You might have an urban college that gets in students with a top percentage and churn out students who once again are toppers, whereas you have colleges who do not get students with very high marks. So we do a cohort analysis to see what is the admission process, what is the student profile, and do you cater to diverse needs? To what extent is the teaching learning process interactive? What is the pedagogical methods that, are, that is made use of in the classrooms? 
what are the mechanisms that an institution has to assure teacher quality, the evaluation process and reforms. It's always been said that if there's one thing that the higher education system in India needs to change, it is the examination process. So do we have continuous assessment? Do we have internal weightages? Do we have termed examinations? A whole lot of issues are addressed in evaluation process and reform. And the last one, best practices in teaching, learning and evaluation. Let me now go to criteria three, which is research, consultancy and extension. The focus of this criteria is on the research culture within a college or a university. How does the institution promote research? We try to look at the research and publication output of the faculty, of the research scholars. Are, there, uh, are the articles cited, cited in journals? What is the citation index? Does the institution have a mechanism for consultancy work and the various extension activities, the outreach activities that any institution has, collaborations with the civil society is an important indicator. And as I mentioned earlier, the best practices under this criteria. In criteria four, which is infrastructure and learning resources, we'd like to look at what are the facilities that a college or a university has for uh, the overall student personality development. We look at the physical facilities, the maintenance of the infrastructure, some important components of uh, infrastructure are the, li are the library, ICT, and any other facilities which help student life on campus. We are well aware that bricks and mortar do not make an institution, but then they form an essential component of the evaluation of any good educational workspace. Criteria 5, which goes into student support and progression, is very important because it, makes, it gives us a good indicator of where our students are going after, the, after their uh, three-year course or five-year course at a particular institution. So what is the student progression? The student support activities, it may be in the form of the canteen, it may be in form of well, the form of welfare services, it could be alumni associations, any number of activities that, the, that a student has on campus. And if there is anything specific that any college or university has, it would come under the category of best practices. Let me go on to the next criteria, which is governance and leadership. Here we believe that leadership plays a crucial role in the quality in the quality offerings of an institution in the overall framework of quality evaluation. In this context, there are a few indicators which we give a lot, which the NAC gives a lot of importance to, the institutional vision and leadership. In fact, experience from NAC tells me that a, law, a, a number of colleges which did not even know what mission and vision statements were, they began looking at themselves once again to articulate a mission statement and a vision statement so that you have some kind of a, uh, shall I say, a blueprint or a path on which you could move along. Uh, the governance and leadership, we also look at strategic, uh, strategic planning, human resource management, financial resources, and if there are best practices in any institution, the, the idea behind best practices is that we are able to compile these best, identify best practices, compile them, and disseminate them across institutions so that the wheel does not have to be reinvented again and again. The last criteria on which evaluation is done is through the innovative practices of an institution, a slight overlap between best practices and innovative practices. But this is done once again to give institutions the space to innovate, the space to have, uh, shall I say, uh, new directions as far as institutional practices are concerned. Here we look at the internal quality assurance system, which is very, very important the inclusive practices of students, uh, I mean inclusive practices of institutions and stakeholder relationships. Educational institutions no longer can function as an island. We have a large number of stakeholders to whom we are accountable 
students, parents, civil society, government, employers, corporate world and the list gets enlarged as we go along, as we build our collaborations. So stakeholder relationships become very important. Now all these seven criteria, how do we evaluate an institution? These criteria are given weightages and depending on the type of institution, a university, an autonomous college and an affiliated college, the weightages vary. The reasons for this being the functions of these institutions are different. For example, a university has the freedom to frame its own curriculum, whereas an affiliated college has to only transact the curriculum given to it by the university. An autonomous college has reasonable freedom to develop its own curriculum. Take, an, uh, take the next example of research consultancy and extension. A university is expected to do research whereas an autonomous college is still a college so the weightage is a little less and an affiliated college main function is teaching, learning and evaluation so research has not been given that importance. So this differential weightage is done based on the philosophy and the expected functioning of each of, each of these institutions and the maximum score that any institution could get is 1000. Um, there are of course the, uh, the key aspects are further given minute, uh, further given differential weightages which we will not go into but the uh, message is that uh, weightages are given appropriately for different kinds of institutions. Once an institution prepares the self-study report, it is submitted to the NAC. Uh, the NAC constitutes a team. Uh, this team is called the peer team. It's called peer because it's a group of people from similar institutions who visit. It's not an inspectoral committee. The team visits the institutions, validates the self-study report and then finally gives its report, uh, gives the peer team report. The peer team report of course is approved by the statutory authorities of the NAC and the final outcome is in the form of a letter grade where, uh, which is uh, displayed right now. Inst institutions which score less than 1.50 are not accredited because they are unsatisfactory. The level of academic accomplishment is below the minimum level and beyond that 1.5 to 2 is C, 2 to 3 is B and 3 to 4 is A grade on the accredited part. Uh, there have been a large number of variations in our reporting of outcomes since the inception of NAC. We started off with an ABCD grade, moved into a star grading system. We were criticized a lot when we start when we moved into the star grading. It was compared to the hotel stars. It was said that it was elitist. Then we had a national brainstorming where we moved into a nine point rating scale of A, A plus, A plus plus, B, B plus plus plus, etc. But the bottom line being institutions which scored 55% and above were accredited and those below were not. Subsequently, we found that the nine point grading scale once again was difficult to handle by the peers because the differentiation was very, very minute. This is when the NAC moved into the CGPA system and now we, it's relatively stable across the institutions we have evaluated. If I may say that self-study or introspection is the basic premise on which assessment and accreditation is undertaken. A logical question which would come up is, is an on-site visit essential? Why an on-site visit and if so, why is it essential at all? I think an on-site visit is essential because without doing an on-site visit, maybe the self-study would never take place at all. While we are all self-regulating individuals, self-regulating institutions, we need some kind of an external force, some kind of an external incentive to put things in place and the on-site visit helps us to validate the self-study report. It also gives a forum to consolidate the institution's experience and create an internal motivation and focus. 
there is a tremendous amount of synergy which is created whenever an institution undergoes the self-study process and the peer team visits the institution. With this uh, on-site visit completed, what is it that the institution is going through between the, application, between the application for a self-study and the final outcome? It is a change process, a change process which we all need to accept, a change process in which we are leaving the present and moving over into the future. The accreditation process when it was initially started, we did face, uh, the NAC did face a lot of resistance, a lot of resistance because people tend to feel that they lose control over what's happening within an institution and experience has also shown that resistance occurs when change is positive because we are not too sure of where and what it will lead us to. If change is so important, it is also essential that as leaders of institutions, as students who are taking part in this particular program on diploma in higher education, we understand what are the critical success factors for successful change management and look at factors for a sustained leadership and create a communication channel within the institution to foster a collaborative culture since no accreditation or no quality assessment and accreditation can take place in isolation. It would require all parties within the institution to come together and this communication channel is very important if we need to manage change within a college or a university. Uh, the total number of institutions that higher education in India has is rapidly changing, increasing. We have something like 18,000 plus colleges and 400 plus universities, many more being added. Latest National Knowledge Commission has recommended the establishment of 1,500 more universities. If this is a scenario, why is it that we are still resisting evaluation, resisting change? Uh, from experience, we can say that some of the mental blocks for assessment, particularly amongst teachers, particularly amongst institutions that have been there for a long period of time, one is tradition. We always have done things this way and we would like to continue doing it this way, so hence we are resistant to any kind of evaluation. The second point is inertia. Why should we change how we are doing it? And finally, of course, a desire to control. Maybe governments want to say that institutions will comply and do what they are told. And hence, as long as, it's made wo as, long as it retains its voluntary nature, a large number of institutions, a large number of clientele do not get into the fold of assessment and accreditation. Uh, on the part of institutions, there are recurring concerns which uh, kind of uh, put an institution on caution before they undergo the accreditation process, before they are evaluated. And some of these concerns are, one, fear of change. What will happen if the institution is accredited? What will happen if the institution is not accredited? What are the factors that will impact any of the changes within a college or a university. The second concern that is predominant is fear of the purpose for which the results are to be used. Are there incentives, disincentives built into the system? What will happen if I don't get a good enough grade? Are there, are there factors which will prevent my institution from receiving funding? Once again, isolated experiences have shown that governments have used it as a punitive measure, though it originally the idea of accreditation, the idea of assessment was that it should be a facilitative tool. In many institutions, it is difficult to secure senior level participation this goes back to the mental block for assessment that we tradition, we've always done things this way and hence we do not want to change. The next point is procrastination. 
let's put off something that can be done or that need not be done now there's always a later time to do it lack of appropriate skill sets maybe institutions are not aware what is expected during the assessment and accreditation cycle and towards this end the nac conducts a large number of awareness programs advocacy programs so that institutions are made aware of what is expected having quickly gone through the nac's accreditation process here are a few challenges which higher education in general and any evaluation system would face when they when accreditation is put in place accreditation is not a new phenomena the world over for example it has a history of more than 100 years in the country of its origin which is the us and in view of the increasing internationalization and globalization of higher education almost all countries are putting accreditation mechanisms in place in addition to accreditation mechanisms there are also networks of accrediting agencies all these are very important developments towards recognition mutual recognition of qualifications um, can i just interrupt you here i think we'll uh, take the start taking the calls i okay. think we've reached the end of your yeah, presentation uh, yes jaipur please come up jaipur are you there hello yes please go on हेलो हेलो हाँ मैडम आई वुड लाइक ए क्वेश्चन अबाउट नेक व्हाट इज द फंक्शन ऑफ नेक अबाउट प्राइवेट यूनिवर्सिटीज और Uh, thank you jaipur i think it was uh, with regard to nacs functioning vis a vis private universities i mean uh, uh, the nacs uh, the nacs mandate is uh, shall i say national in nature we evaluate both private and public institutions the criteria are uniform but depending on the particular uh, maybe i mean if you call it a private university or the university's legislated uh, by the state and which are totally private in nature there is more emphasis given on governance and leadership uh thank you dr pille i think there is still some uh, of the slides remaining probably we could quickly okay uh, i i yeah i let me do it quickly yeah. i just wanted to uh highlight a few since the topic that is under discussion is accreditation and quality issues i said i thought let me highlight a few issues which <laughs> so i want to get i think uh, learners are finding the discussion very interesting so they all want to pitch in yes kora put please ask your question go ahead good afternoon dr pillay the honorable provider chancellor and puna my friend this is koraput resume center we have now six participants with us along with the resource person the resource person has a question to ask to dr pillay i'm handing over to him uh, i'm dr n pradhan uh, thanks uh, madam pillay for your detailed presentation uh, as per your presentation nac has been established uh, to improve or assess and improve the quality of higher education but it is seen that the educational institutions that are i think the lines got disconnected koraput could you please put up your question again i think there has been some problem with the line uh, meanwhile you were talking about these uh, yeah, remaining I, issues right i i wanted to bring up a few more issues which uh, we need to address when it been when we talk of accreditation should accreditation be merely catalytic and facilitative or mandatory a very important uh, point for educationists to consider yes yes koraput please go ahead yeah we have we have come back again please hold on uh, madam my question was uh, nac has been established to assess and improve the quality of higher education but it is seen that the educational institutions that are highly rated on the basis of seven criteria that you have said are given more assistance uh, in compared to those those that are uh, rate, uh, rated low 
uh, is it rational madam and again how this principle enhance the quality of higher education particularly in poor educational institution thank you uh, the next take on this particular aspect has also always been that institutions which are graded well should receive incentives those who have not been graded well due to various reasons i mean uh, you can't pinpoint one particular reason they should also be suitably uh, facilitated and strengthened in fact we've conducted a large number of state wise analysis of our peer team reports and made recommendations to re to respective state governments the karnataka government has taken it very seriously the maharashtra government has taken it very seriously whereby mechanisms are in place to help institutions tide over their difficulties so a low rating on nac is not viewed punitively rather it's it helps in securing more funds from the funding agencies uh just a related question i uh, also would like to ask you i mean there is this question which is being articulated always that uh, there is no level playing field you know in terms of the institutions and so on so because certain institutions have had a better uh, start you know they always continue to improve as compared to others so i mean uh, objectively speaking then they are not on the same level Uh, and then ra you did mention about a differential weightage in terms of rating and all, but that does that apply to other aspects also? Because after all, there is an institutional culture which gets built up because of the initial head start also. Um, I think there is uh, some merit in what you say, but to a large extent, these are factored into the evaluation process, and the differential weightages do uh, does uh, take care of. Uh, institutional differences but yes the head start that a particular institution has is always a positive and a positive feature for example if you look at which are the institutions which volunteered for accreditation first it is the good institutions institutions which had confidence in themselves who came through the process first and subsequently it was through mandates either by the state government or by any other regulatory body uh, we have a call from shillong yes shillong please go ahead we have a call from shillong yes shillong please go ahead good afternoon ma'am you said that the accreditation is uh, moved from the letter grade to that of 9 point grading scale and now you said it is uh, what is being done is a cgpa system so would this be accumulative of all the credits maybe from the first second and third visit ma'am please kindly elaborate on this Uh, the CGPA that uh, the NAC has gone into now, it's not a cumulative of, uh, you know, one, two, three visits, but it is a cumulative of the scores that the institution gets during that particular visit. Uh, I must mention at this point that accreditation is valid for a period of five years. subsequent to which a two year period is given for the institution to prepare for reaccreditation and after that the institution goes into the second cycle which is called reaccreditation in reaccreditation what is done is with the institution is evaluated against its performance during the immediate past 5 years compared to the first cycle when the entire history of the institution was taken into account so the cgpa is actually a cumulative grade point of all the criteria put together uh, thank you dr pille uh, i would still like to invite more questions from all the regional centers because we have about 10 minutes to end this program and uh, in the meantime i would like to ask you a question uh, you mentioned about uh, academic flexibility there's a lot of criticism in our colleges especially those who are not in a position to partake in the development of curriculum and so on the uh, fact of the matter is that there are huge
class is to teach and there is no control on the formulation or design of the curriculum. So the teachers do get bogged down by finishing or completing in one particular academic year the curriculum, I mean the transaction of the curriculum. Is there any kind of a scope available to the teachers? I mean a, lo a large number of these colleges who have no autonomy in uh, any kind of, a, uh, I mean either altering their uh, teaching learning strategies or evaluation methods to uh, get into this academic flexibility because they say that they are so bogged down by the transaction of the curriculum itself which is just passed on to them that there is no scope or provision for trying out other things. Um, this is a question that's asked time and again when we talk particularly to affiliated colleges. The way I would like to respond to it is the syllabus for a particular college is prescribed by the university and curriculum is something much beyond that. It's the flesh and blood which the teacher puts into the system. So academic flexibility as yes, large numbers is an issue but academic flexibility I think is available to most institutions and it's operated in different ways. We have colleges which offer choice based credit system. We have colleges which still follow the annual examination with total external evaluation. We have colleges which have an online examination pattern and those which are very traditional. So I think the spectrum is so wide that there is adequate scope for institutions to innovate, for institutions to set their own benchmarks. Uh, Thank you, Dr. Pillay. Yet another question uh, while waiting for the learners to uh, put up their questions. Uh, this question is related to the fact that when we are talking about mechanisms of feedback with regard to t teaching learning process going on, are students being considered as stakeholders whose feedback is important also? Uh, in fact, student feedback forms a very important part of the NAC's uh, appraisal mechanism. And the NAC itself had prepared suggestive questionnaires which colleges could use. And there are some institutions which have done very systematic student appraisal, not for the sake of NAC itself, because very often there is this criticism that a lot of uh, things which happen on campus is for the sake of the NAC visit and then everything withers away. But student evaluation, yes, is carried out very systematically in many colleges and I would say it's used as an honest mechanism of improvement within a college. Uh, there are alumni feedback mechanisms which institutions use. Uh, there are parent feedbacks, um, all kinds of mechanisms. There are colleges which have set up internal quality assurance cells. One of the main functions is to collect feedback and use it. Some of them have now gone into 360 degree feedback a lot of corporate exercises moving into the academic arena as well. Uh, another issue which I would like you to throw a little light on is the fact that uh, success of NAC and the institutions in terms of addressing quality issues depends on a lot on the structures of management and organizations which prevail within the institutions. So the mindsets are not there in terms of attitudes, but they get also translated into the hardening of the structures. Democratization, for instance, is an issue which is still there, you know, hasn't been addressed adequately in the university system. And there are other issues of governance as well. So, I mean, uh, how do you see this correlation between quality and uh, a change in organizational and administrative setup in the higher education institutions? It's true that there is a kind of commonality among many institutions when it comes to governance structures, maybe because of the, if I am allowed to use the word, archaic uh, structures that are there within, uh, in most of the institutions. But with the new breed of colleges and some universities coming up, changes, there is a uh, there is, I would say, reasonable change being visible and there is also a perceptible difference in the way the new institutions would like to look at governance and make qualitative improvements. Uh, it's in this context that the internal quality assurance cell 
is playing a very facilitative role and contributing towards an informed decision making uh, across the institution. Uh, yes, Hyderabad, you can put up your question. Uh, hello, madam. I am I am Balraju, student of PGDHC, Igno Hyderabad, and I am lecturer of College of Education, that is IAC Hyderabad, madam. My question is, uh, NAC is meant for assessing and uh, accrediting the colleges and universities in higher education. Uh, does it include distance education, madam? Please clarify. My question is over. Thank you, madam. Well, uh, let me respond to this question. Uh we look at higher education, all kinds of higher education institutions and we look when we evaluate a university if it has a distance education component we also look at how the distance education is functioning but so far we have not evaluated open universities because there is a distance education council which is mandated to do this particular job. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Pillay. We still have about three, four minutes to close this session and uh, we could take in a couple of uh, questions at this moment. But in the meantime, I would uh, like to ask you another question, which is this, that you mentioned about a very important aspect uh, with regard to evaluation, which is about self-regulation. I mean, all of us are adults and self-regulating uh, individuals as well as organizations. I mean, uh, how much do you think is this objective, the, the peer visit, how, how much of objectivity do you attribute to this visit and how much of it do you see as some kind of an imposition which might be resisted from uh, colleges because, you know, the culture specificities of college is also something which cannot be standardized and which cannot be appreciated. Uh, I'd like to respond to this question. It's like evaluating answer scripts of our students. I think there is a certain bottom line which is very objective and which a student has to get marks. The subjective component is very, very minimal. So, so be it when it happens in a peer team visit. The peer team is there to validate what an institution has said, validate the self-study report and of course capture the cultural uh, underpinnings of the institution. So I think with the refinements in the evaluation process that the NAC itself has been constantly going through, the scope for subjectivity is minimized. I won't say it is 100% objective and I don't think it can be 100%. It's after all an evaluation, but it's largely subjective, uh, largely objective, sorry. Uh, Dr. Pillay, we just have about two minutes to wind this session and I would like you to have the last uh, comment with regard to how you see NAC's role in the coming future, especially with the, in the context of globalization and external agencies also coming in. Well, uh, being associated with NAC since its inception, I am one who strongly believes that accreditation should remain voluntary. Uh, nevertheless, funding agencies and other governmental bodies have felt that anything which is uh, voluntary may not succeed in our country and hence there are moves to make it mandatory. Uh, to me, the success of a quality assurance agency would lie in the stakeholders building confidence, having confidence in the process and this confidence building of the entire educational system involves large scale advocacy and large scale involvement of stakeholders. It cannot be a top down approach by someone prescribing and having to, uh, you know, undergo the process. So to me, it should be a voluntary process. It should be a process where institutions feel the need to benchmark themselves, to better themselves and move from, I would always say, move from best practices to next practices if the quality of education has to improve. Thank you very much, Dr. Pillay. We have come to the close of this session.
and uh, we are going to uh, break for uh, 15 minutes. We'll come back at 1 o'clock and address uh, yet another important aspect uh, of Indian higher education. We'll let you know the topic then. Thank you very much for this session. Thank you, Dr. Pillai, once again. And we'll be there at 1 o'clock. Thank you, Dr. Poonam.